So guys, welcome to tonight's webinar, eight ways to maintain your proficiency as a pilot. And I've been so excited to do this webinar because I have, when I say a super special guest, um, I, I really mean it. And, and, and we're going to get to that here in a second. I want to, I want to get a few uh, logistic things out of the way. Uh, but guys, we have a awesome webinar on tap. My goal is to roll with about 45 minutes of presentation. Uh, and then of course, at the end, as we always do in our webinars, open it up for you guys for questions. Maybe you have questions about something we said on the webinar, or maybe you have questions about anything aviation related. We're more than happy to take those uh, those questions. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's get some of the formalities out of the way. First and foremost, a little bit about how this works. What's going to happen, guys, is I'm going to present and you guys feel free to ask your questions at any time. Now, as I've shared uh, earlier, you ask your questions via that handy dandy go to webinar control panel underneath the question tab of uh, myself, uh, John, Keith, Will, uh, Jim. We have these question boxes open uh, so we can see your questions as they're coming in. And chances are you'll get a response from us. There are a lot of people on this webinar. Um, there's a lot coming in too, uh, as I'm seeing them all arriving. So uh, do give us some time to take all those questions, but I'll make sure uh, that we get all those questions at the end. This is being recorded. So if you come in late ever at any of our webinars, you know you'll get the recording. If you have to leave early or you're in and out or you're putting the kids down for bed, I understand this is being recorded uh, and I'll get it to you first thing in the morning uh, uh, via email. So you guys will have access to that as well. So that's a little bit about how this works, guys. Tonight's learning objective is this. We're going to teach you guys eight ways to maintain your proficiency as a pilot. We're going to talk a lot about what, what uh, AOPA and Jim call these rusty pilots. And what I want to share is whether you're a true rusty pilot or whether you're a pilot trying to maintain proficiency, I'm going to share with you some great tips. Maybe uh, you know, you're somewhere, maybe you're like, you know, in New York, like Brian, of course, Brian, I saw on Facebook went flying, the, you know, the other day anyways, but maybe the winter weather's got you down. You can't go flying right now. Well, I'm going to share with you some ways to work on the ground to maintain that proficiency. I'm going to share with you my three must practice items. These are things not only do all my students do, but these are things I do myself. We're going to hear some us, uh, some actual rusty pilot stories uh, from Jim, uh, and Jim's going to share some of his best tips. So uh, let's get into a few introductions. Uh, again, a lot of you guys know who I am, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on this. Uh, just recently, uh, I was named AOPA Outstanding Flight Instructor, uh, 2014, author of eight best-selling books, and the producer of Flying Again. A lot of you guys have seen our movie we're working on. We're really capturing the process of getting rusty pilots current again um, and, and kind of showcasing that. Uh, it's going to be very, very cool. The project's up on Kickstarter. We'll share more about that uh, at the end. But enough, enough about me, uh, who I really want to spend some time talking about uh, is Jim Minow. So Jim Minow is the executive director of the AOPA Foundation, a Beechcraft Sundowner owner, and you know, I'm kind of partial, well, sort of partial. My very first flight uh, was actually in a musketeer, uh, so in that, uh, in that same kind of family, and a former uh, rusty pilot himself. So I'm going to unmute Jim real quick, and uh, Jim, my friend, how are you doing? Great. Thank you, Jason. Looking forward to this and uh, appreciate uh, all of the great organizing you're doing uh, with uh, with Rusty Pilots and uh, really with pilots everywhere. So thanks. Uh, thrilled to be uh, be participating. Well, thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. And I know uh, everyone on this webinar is so excited uh, to kind of hear what, what you and AOPA have in store and, and more importantly, learn about you too. Uh, you're, uh, you know, uh, 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 certainly a figurehead there at AOPA and a name that uh, everyone's going to know, uh, that's for sure. So uh, anyways, Jim, why don't we uh, uh, dive right into it? And if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing your rusty pilot story. Be, be happy to. Thank you, Jason. So um, I learned to fly uh, in college and I've learned to fly uh, Beechcraft airplanes um, and uh, racked up about uh, four or 500 hours over a 
eight or nine period of time and year uh, per, eight or nine year period of time and then uh, and then like uh, I'm sure many of you uh, on this webinar um, um, life got in the way um, uh, got married had kids had to start you know preschool and college savings and all of those kinds of things and and so uh, I just had a different set of priorities for uh, for for a good number of years as as my children grew up as as uh, as they went on on the college and 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 as I developed a uh, a career first on the West Coast uh, where I'm from, uh, the state of California, and then on the East Coast where I moved in in uh, 1994. Uh, so um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was starting to think about, uh, you know, maybe it's time to be thinking about doing something um, different in your life. Now, I really wasn't thinking so much about a career change or at that point even working for um, AOPA or the AOPA Foundation, but, but I thought that, that flying might be um, just the kind of thing that would, that would uh, you know, in a sense reawaken a lifestyle that, uh, that I once had as a younger man and, um, and, and could now um, afford at a level that, uh, uh, that perhaps I, was, uh, I couldn't when I was uh, Younger and had the kids growing up and going to college. So, so on almost a spur of the moment, I I, I made a decision that uh, that I wanted to start flying again and I wanted to get current. So, but and I think what's really interesting about this is is that um, is is that the decision that I made came about while it came about as a spur of the moment decision. What I really focused on was the need to go all in and that's that's probably the first thing that I would say to all of you who are rusty pilots or who are thinking about getting back or maybe some of you are partially back al already is is that if, you, if you're going to do this make a decision and kind of go all in and that's and, and that's really what I did I did a, a, a sort of a traditional okay I'm gonna go to an FBO I'm gonna get a little bit of information I'm gonna see what's changed what hasn't changed I'm gonna find out what I have to do to get current again um, and how do I begin to brush up on my skills and the, and the, the first decision that uh, you know that I needed to make that 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 I really wasn't even fully aware of is, is like do I go all in or do I go to sport uh, and I made a decision to uh, um, to to essentially go all in, and and by that I mean you really need to make a commitment if you're going to do this, because as you'll hear from Jason, and we've all heard from Jason over the years, um, we all want to fly proficiently, we want to fly safely, and we want to fly with a great deal of knowledge. And there's a whole lot of new information that's that that's out there. So so. I began with a with a sort of simple process of of thinking. Well, gee, you know, gosh, I guess I'm going to have to be thinking about ground school. Um, so, uh, I, I, ground school is a term, interestingly, that you will hardly even hear anymore, unless maybe you're starting out as a as a, as a brand new pilot, because everything you need. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Everything you need um, to get current again as a as a rusty pilot. Um, from a ground school perspective is available to you on the internet. Um, it is just amazing what is out there and how much you can become current in your knowledge, um, how you can knock a lot of the rust off, how you can, um, can, can really get back into the process of being in the cockpit without being in the cockpit. Um, on the on the internet. And this is really where I discovered Jason and several other folks on the internet who who uh, who are very proficient as as internet-based um, instructors, and uh, although I must say, and here's an ad for Jason, he is really among the best of them, as many of you know. The uh, the information that's there, um, first of all, comes in in all kinds of forms. But you can take ground schools on the internet that are free. You can take ground schools on the internet that you, that that folks that folks charge for. You have lots of video that's available to you. There's there's weather information. There's all kinds of things about flight planning. So the whole world about how you acquire information and get current again in information um, is available to you at your fingertips, um, at your desk, at home, at night, on weekends, whenever you want. You can dive right into a lesson, and there's somebody like Jason who's available to explain it all to you. 
The interesting thing about this in terms of diving into, into my story to start flying again um, is, is I felt fully informed before I even got back into the cockpit. Now that wasn't really true. There were clearly some things that only an instructor um, can, can share with you that you need to get directly from an instructor. We'll cover that a little bit later. But, but, the, but the bottom line here is, is, is that, is that if, you're, if you're worried about how much information you need to relearn, you can do it, but go all in, take it seriously, focus on safety, focus on absorbing as much as you possibly can that's available to you on the internet before you step back into that cockpit. In that way, you will be really ready with the answers that your flight instructor um, starts to send you, the, the question, the answers to the questions that the flight instructor starts to, to send your way. Lots of things have changed, a lot of things have not changed, but my first piece of advice in all of this is, is learn from the seat in your house uh, and then start looking at about how you're going to find the right flight instructor, the right school, and the right airplane to go get current again. Um, let me stop there and see, Jason, if you want to add anything. No, uh, what you're saying is is awesome. And, you know, guys, this is a message we've been preaching for so long, and now we're hearing it, you know, from the horse's mouth. I mean, Jim is the executive director of the AOPA Foundation uh, telling you to start on the ground. Uh, you know, to, a lot of these tips that we're going to share about all happen, like we said, you know, on the ground. So, uh, Jim, I have a question for you, and then we'll kind of dive into some of these strategies that we're talking about. Um, when you were a rusty pilot and it was time to get back in the cockpit, what do you believe you struggled with the most? Was it the skill of flying or was it getting the knowledge back in your head? The uh, great, great question, Jason, and um, and and I would say that the, um, um, the the most challenging thing is is making sure that you understand as much about the airspace, um, especially here in the East, um, as as you possibly can. Number one, and and number two, the second thing that has 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 changed pretty significantly. Um, is uh, is the, is the, the ability to navigate with with GPS and the sophistication of the radios. So so there's a lot of, of of radio management today with with the new GPS systems that are, um, I, I you know I wouldn't say that they're challenging exactly, but 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 the radios have. Lots of buttons, a lot of little push buttons, lots of direct to buttons, lots of stuff that if you're not familiar with is a, is a pretty big learning curve. And you can spend, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours, um, you know, learning about some of the newer GPS radios that are available and you still only know 20% about what, of, of what they're capable of doing. So, um, so, so that's, a, that, that's probably the first the, the first two things that you really need to familiarize yourself with and know what you are doing when you get back into that cockpit. Number one, navigate uh, airspace. Number two, radio management. No, I, uh, I totally agree with you, Jim. Uh, very, very, uh, just great insight. So uh, guys, let's start to, let's keep moving forward here and kind of get into some of the meat and potatoes. But before we, before we do that, I want to share some stats with you guys really quick. So, uh, and again, this is thanks to the research over at AOPA. This is directly on their Rusty Pilot website, which we'll be sharing at the end of this. Uh, there's an estimated 500,000 lapsed pilots under the age of 75, compared to our pilot population of 618,000 current or active pilots. So putting these two numbers together gives us our pilot population. Guys, this is 45% of our pilot population that has effectively lapsed. What can we do to stay out of this number? And if we're in this number, what can we do to get over here into this number? Because According to AOPA, 87% of those lapsed pilots that they surveyed plan on getting back into flying. Just like Jim said, life gets in the way sometimes. For some people, it's finances. For some people, it's time. For some people, it might be a spouse that doesn't want you to fly. There's a lot of reasons. But 
We're going to work to keep you out of this number. And if you're in this number, we're going to share with you how to get back down into this number tonight. That is our goal. And what I want you to walk away from this webinar understanding is that there's a big difference, guys, between currency and proficiency. Because currency is, oh, I do my flight review every two years. Currency is, oh, I, you know, oh, geez, I need to take some passengers flying. So let me do my, let me do my three takeoffs and landings in the same category. And you go through the whole, you know, it's just enough to get by is what it is. I have two students, unfortunately. I call them students. Everybody's a student to me when I, when I meet with them and fly with them. Um, Unfortunately, I only see them every 24 calendar months. They do nothing else in between. They don't fly. When I open up their logbook two years later, 24 calendar months later, I was the last entry in their logbook. And I explained to them, I said, listen, you got to realize this isn't going to be an easy BFR. You haven't flown. Oh, Jason, I know. I, I just want to keep current. I don't really want to go flying. I just want to say I have it and say that I'm current. You know, but that's, that's a scary proposition that you're current, you're legal, but are you proficient? There's a difference between being legal and being safe. And that's what we're going to go through tonight, guys. So what can we do? Guys, I'm about to share with you eight great tips to maintain that proficiency as a pilot. We're going to start with the easiest, start with the most common and work to the most difficult and the really advanced techniques. So let's get started with one that I bet 95% of us on this webinar know, but may or may not be practicing. And that of course is the art of chair flying. Guys, you've heard M0A.com, family and friends know this. I say this over and over and over until I'm blue in the face. But the power of chair flying is so great. Sit, picture this with me. Let's together run through a in-flight emergency such as an engine failure. I'm sitting back in my big, comfy, lazy boy chair. I close my eyes and I visualize it. I'm flying along. I'm at 3,500 feet and all of a sudden my engine quits. What do I do? Well, because, you know, I chair fly, I've got this muscle memory down. I know. Let's go through my ABCs in an emergency. A is for my airspeed. I'm pitching for it. I'm trimming. B is for my best landing area. Keep it in mind, my best landing area might be behind me or below me. C is my checklist. I'm not going to fumble around with a checklist. I have my flow checklist. And as I'm sitting in my lazy boy chair, eyes closed, I'm visualizing fuel selector valve on both. Working my hand up to my mixture. Mixture's rich. Coming across if I have carb heat, carb heat on. Coming all the way across to my ignition. Verify my ignition's on. I didn't actually bump it. Let's try to start it again. Crank, crank, crank. Darn it, nothing happened. What do I do now? 121.57700, mayday, mayday, mayday. And we just practiced on the ground an in-flight engine failure. You can do the same with slow flight. You can do the same with your stalls. All your flight maneuvers, traffic patterns can be chair flown. I worked with, again, those of you who've seen the trailer for our movie Flying Again, I worked with uh, Bill Clayton, who you see in that film. Bill and I took chair flying to the next notch. We went out to the ramp area at the airport, and he was left of me, and I was right of him. <coughs> Excuse me. And we literally walked the traffic pattern on the ramp. Bill said, okay, I'm rolling down the runway. Full power, heels hitting the floor, toes to the bottom of the pedals. And, and we walked through everything. We made our crosswind call, our downwind call. And we walked through the traffic pattern. Guys, learn to chair fly. The airplane is a terrible classroom. The airplane is meant to demonstrate what you know. Learn it on the ground, and then let's go up in the air and apply it. On days when you can't fly, chair fly that beautiful flight chair fly your flight maneuvers okay that is what i want you to do be chair flying all right i'm gonna grab a sip of tea as we flip over to tip number two tip number two stay involved at the airport how many people uh, and you can just type in me in the question box if it's you how many people are involved at their airport would you say you're in a social flying club by social flying club i don't mean like you know, four guys who bought an airplane. I mean, you're in a you're in a real flying club, you know, or you attend local flying events. Look at what AOPA just did all around the country. 
There was no reason you couldn't make it to one of the AOPA flying events or maybe your local FAA, the fast seminars. I mean, who on this webinar? Absolutely. Absolutely. Brian, JD, Jason. Uh, yeah, Todd. Absolutely. Guys, staying involved at the airport. You may not be able to fly. Maybe finances are holding you back. Time, business, you're, you're, you're so busy. But I guarantee you can give up a Saturday to go to your local AOPA fly-in and check everything out and, and talk to other pilots and attend the seminars they have there. I guarantee you can join some sort of flying club, preferably a more social flying club that has monthly meetings. You know, I, I do, geez, when we did our good pilot tour, we'll be doing it again uh, uh, in 2015. I bet 50% of the, the stops we had were at flying clubs who wanted us to speak at their monthly fly-in or their monthly get together. You've got to have that social aspect of, of aviation. That's what keeps us around. Get involved at the airport. I know so many people that just volunteer their time, Civil Air Patrol, whatever it may be, find a way to get involved at your airport, all right? Everybody's got at least one Saturday or, or, or one weekend. Uh, they can do that. Uh, Phil brought up a great point. The IMC clubs, that should be another bullet point there. Absolutely, IMC clubs are awesome for my instrument, guys, because it's social, you're learning, and you're challenging yourself with great ideas. Absolutely. Tip number two, Stay involved at the airport, even if you're not flying. And it's a great way to segue back into flying. I can't tell you how many times I've just been hanging out at the airport, hanging out in the maintenance hangar. And the guy says, hey, we need to go test flight this new 430 I just put in. You want to go with me? Absolutely, I want to go with you. Stay involved at the airport. Tip number three, keep on learning. Guys, you know, M0A.com fans and family know this. We have built an entire business on the premise that a good pilot is always learning. You guys on this webinar right now are truly the 1% because you guys have taken time at your Thursday night to learn something new or maybe just to hear, maybe something you already know, but to hear it again. Keep hearing and hearing and hearing, okay? You're the 1%. Uh, you know, you are the, the, the safest pilots out there because you're continuing your education. And I know, Jim, like you alluded to in your story, you have a lot you kind of want to share uh, in this department because th this tip really kind of helped you segue back into aviation. So if you want to take it away on those last few bullet points. Ab ab absolutely. And um, the, the keep on learning thing, you know, you referred to me, Jason, earlier as a former rusty pilot. Um, you know, I consider myself still to be a rusty pilot because we're, we're always learning and we're always focusing on improving our skills. And most importantly, I think as a rusty pilot, you really, really, really want to focus on safety. Um, and and you, you, you want to make sure that as you're going back into flying, that you're 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 doing all of the safe things first, and the and and that is a critical part of the of of the learning experience um, as you go back into this. Because if you're going to go flying, especially at our ages, you know you're going to want to go flying with people. You're going to want to bring your family, your children, your if you have grandchildren, your your you know your grandchildren along. So you want to do things with an airplane when you get back into it. So safety really has to be paramount in our in, in our minds. So with with that in mind, let me just I talked a little earlier about how the internet has changed everything and, and it really has. So 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 first of all, if you have any question about flying and about preparation for flying, you can find the answer on the internet. I guarantee you. And you'll 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 find it in a lot of great places. Again, Jason's videos um, are are phenomenal. They put you in the cockpit. He, he does such a great job of explaining uh, of the, the procedures that you go through, the practice that you do, the proficiency that you need, that you need to have. So, so you can get so much practice in um, from the comfort of your home as you begin to start flying that I just can't, can't say enough to, to like use the internet to study, to get information. And, and watch those videos. Go to YouTube because you will learn about crosswind landings. You can learn about takeoff, you know, takeoff procedures and emergency procedures and emergency landings and all of those things Jason was just 
just just talking about you can get a mental picture of what it is that you need to do um, and you should have this picture before you get back in the cockpit you'll just be that much better 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 prepared what else has what what else has changed well weather has changed you know in the in, in the old days, and I'm dating myself here a little bit, going back more than, than 15 and 20, 20 years, is that weather reporting today on the Internet is so much better than the stuff that you get used to get from flight service. Is there, are, there, are, there are radar maps, there are pictorial maps, there is plain English dissemination of all the stuff that that you used to get basically in code, um, and you still need that code. You know, you still need to read all of the short stuff, but, but, but basically, it's it's there, and it's there from a number of sources. So another wonderful thing about the internet is that it, is that you can check the weather from a number of different sources and get a much better picture of where you're flying from and where you're flying to than you than you ever could before. Again, safety and preparation, it is there on the internet. Use it, whether it's Duot or Duots, a, 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 one of the weather tools that I use a lot. Because I think it's a phenomenal tool. I don't know how well known it is. How well known it is. Um, it's called the HEMS tool. It, it, it stands for Helicopter Emergency Management System, but it basically gives you very, very intricate weather uh, basically at about 4,500 feet and below. So you get you get winds, you get you 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 get uh, uh, visibility, you you get forecasts uh, through this through this HEMS tool, and it's really a phenomenal resource for uh, for for local flying. You know, in some ways, uh, better in my opinion than the kinds of things that you might get from a um, from a duot, so if you're just looking to go out and have some fun and and and, and fly around in a, in a in the local pattern for a day, although the weather is available, you know, all over the country through that. And then the final thing is a number of great flight planning tools that are available, um, and just familiarizing yourself with these tools brings you into the 21st century. Um, you know, these are tools um, like uh, Garmin Pilot or ForeFlight. Uh, these are two two uh, two programs that are available for uh, uh, for your iPad or uh, or any other kind of tablet that you um, that you might use. You can even use them on a on a smartphone. Um, I found them to be to be very valuable. I've had a great amount of of, of fun doing flight planning online with a program called Sky Vector, which also carries uh, carries weather as well. Um, you can't use it for real flight planning, but if what you're doing is really looking at practice um, and 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 familiarizing yourself with charts and what those you know people say today, you know whoever flies with a chart anymore when we've got when we've got GPS. Well, I'll tell you those charts are great because one of the things that I do is is I use the GPS, I still use the charts. And, and I still use VOR when, when I fly because there are three great cross-checks that you can do in the cockpit. Why is that important? Because when you're getting acquainted with flying again, more information is far better than less information. The final thing I'll say on this about, um, about what I, it, that is not related to the internet, but, it, but it's related to being the best rusty pilot that you can be, um, is is not only do you want to gather that information, but you want to be very, very humble. You always want to be thinking about what are you going to do if disaster strikes. So this is preparing yourself for emergencies. It's preparing yourself for bad weather situations you don't want to get into. Be very cautious. Be very careful. And remember that if you focus on flying safely, you're going to do just fine. Jason, back to you. Yeah, that is. I'm just over here taking notes about what you're saying. I mean, that, good, good stuff, Jim. Uh, especially, it, it's funny that how how well we're on the same page here. Uh, literally, um, as soon as I know a route I want to fly, it always starts in Sky Vector for me. It, it, it's it's funny you say that. Always start in Sky Vector, kind of checking out the route, looking at everything, seeing that through. Uh, I still personally fly with paper charts as well. I know there's a lot of people on this webinar that might surprise, but I am a redundancy maniac, uh, a, a two flashlight, multiple batteries, you know, type of guy. Um, 
you know, if my iPad dies or my app crashes, both of which have happened, thankfully neither have happened on an instrument approach, um, I'm real thankful that I have that paper in the airplane. So, uh, it, yeah, it may cost me a little bit more to do both, but, geez, I love redundancy. And I love, too, what you shared about the HEMS tool. I had never heard of that, uh, and I got a note to write that down. But if it's, like, super accurate re weather under 4,500 feet, that's, like, 99% uh, of my life is under 4,500 feet. So um, uh, that is just great stuff, Jim. I appreciate you for, uh, uh, for sharing that. Very, very cool. We'll see if we can get a link up. Uh, maybe uh, um, Larry or one of the guys can share a link in the chat to that HEMS tool. So very cool. Let's keep moving forward, guys. Uh, tip number three, keep on learning. A a wait, let me share one last little thing here. Jim shared some really great stuff, but let me let me take it up a notch here. We talked a lot about the iPad. We talked a lot about these great tools. My, You guys know, most of you who listen to us a lot know where I'm going with this. I want you to master it on the ground first. Please don't go get your new iPad, your new iPad app, or your new uh, tool, flight plane tool, your new weather tool, whatever it may be, and go learn it while you're flying. Because that's going to cause so much head down time that you're going to forget about the most important thing, which is flying that airplane. Learn every. It, it, this is the theme of this webinar so far. We're only on tip three. Learn everything you can on the ground. I'll say it again. The airplane is a terrible classroom. Learn everything you can on the ground. Let's move forward now. Um, tip number four. Guys, if you can swing it, and it's really not, you don't have to go this elaborate, invest in a flight simulator. These are pictures of Will. Uh, Will works for us. Uh, he's in the Chesapeake area. Uh, Will works for us, um, and he has this flight simulator in his house. Now, first off, any flight simulator-related questions you have, now is a beautiful time to ask them for Will because he's happy to help you with those. Invest in a flight simulator plus Pilot Edge. For those of you that don't know, Pilot Edge is an awesome service that real air traffic controllers volunteer their time to give you flight following, to give you ATC vectors for approaches and, and everything else, takeoff landing clearances. You are talking to real off-duty controllers effectively using the Pilot Edge system on something like X-Plane. Now, this is Will's. Will did his very elaborate, uh, as you can tell. Guys, if you just did a copy of X-Plane, about $100, and a nice yoke, about another $100, you are already a huge step ahead. Now, here's what I don't want you to do with a flight sim. I don't want you to practice things like landings. That's, that's silly. It's unrealistic. But what a flight simulator is great for Maybe you had to scrub a flight and you want to recreate it on the flight simulator at your house. You can do that. What it's great for is VOR, tracking, interception, navigation, IFR instrument approaches, my private pilot guys practicing your instrument scan, that sort of stuff. That is where a flight simulator truly shines. When you use it as the great tool that it is, plus add something like Pilot Edge, if you struggle with VOR navigation or you struggle with radio calls, this can be a great investment for you and you can get away with it for under 200 bucks. Again, if you have any questions about what you see here and want to know what it is, uh, ask Will. Uh, Will is a pro uh, at this sort of stuff uh, and he's happy to, uh, to help you assist all our online ground school members with their, their simulator stuff. Uh, it is a very, very cool system. I've talked to Will on multiple occasions. Hey, Jason, you know, it's snowing. I can't go flying today, but I'm sitting at the simulator here and I'm practicing my approaches. It is a beautiful thing that keeps you flying for a, a relatively minimal investment. This is a, a little bit of a steeper investment, what you're seeing here. But invest in a flight sim and add Pilot Edge if you can. Tip number five. This kind of goes along the same lines as staying active at the airport. How many on this webinar are involved in something like Angel Flight, Pilots and Paws, uh, Mercy Flight, and there's a bunch, I don't, can't list out all the organizations, there's so many of them. Guys, look into these organizations because although you may not be able, maybe you're not current and you're not able to be the pilot in command for an Angel Flight or a Pilots and Paws mission, they're always looking for qualified co-pilots or qualified ride-along pilots. Maybe you're not current, 
Maybe you don't have the qualifications to be an angel flight PIC, but you'd be awfully handy sitting in the right seat helping with the radios. Or something as simple as just helping watch for traffic. Get yourself involved with one of these organizations, guys. I mean, not only are you doing a great thing for others and a great thing for the aviation community, but you're also keeping yourself current and staying involved. Phil added Civil Air Patrol to this sort of list. Absolutely. The thing is, it's something that is getting you involved and getting you out at the airport. All right. That is a great, great tool. Volunteer your time to some of, some of these wonderful organizations and you'll end up being able to log some time yourself. All right. And chances are it's not going to cost you a whole lot. And on that topic of costs, I want to pass tip number six uh, as we start to bring it on home here uh, back over to Jim. This is kind of Jim's slide here. And he want to kind of put your costs into perspective. Then I'll have a few things to add on at the end. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So, the, the, you know, the first thing I want to say is that everybody on this call or most everybody on this call, whether uh, whether you're current or not, um, is that you have a tremendous asset. Um, you've, you've got a pilot's license. You've got a ticket. Um, it's And if you're not using it, it's an unrealized asset. Um, and the first thing I would encourage everybody with an unrealized asset to do with that asset is put it to work. So if you're going to put it to work, it means you've got to go get current. So if you're going to go get current, it's going to cost you a little bit of money. But put that money in perspective. Um, and and, and by, by perspective, I mean that when you start flying again, you will find that it is a life-changing event. Um, it, will, it, will, it will move your, your perspective on life, your perspective on the future in, in a whole new area that maybe you have forgotten. I know I certainly have forgotten it, um, look, you know, looking as I focused on career and focused on family and all of the, you know, all of these other things, I didn't really know what I was missing. And if I have one regret, it's that I didn't go become active again, get current again, uh, 10 years earlier than, um, that, than I did. You're going to spend some money, but guess what? In the great scheme of things, it may not be as much as you think it's, it's going to be. You can buy a very good used airplane that's probably every bit as capable as the airplane you learned to fly in for $40,000 or less, sometimes far less than $40,000. Buy that with a couple of partners, and all of a sudden you're into flying again for the cost of less than a used car. And you're an airplane owner. And now you can do things with that airplane, although it's going to cost you, you're going to do things with that airplane that are not out of the realm of the same kind of costs that you would have if you bought a motorcycle, if you bought a boat, if you took a vacation to Europe every now and then. Believe it or not, it is not as expensive as you might think it is, particularly if you research some lower cost airplanes in terms of maintenance, annuals, those, the, those kinds of things. Of course, you don't have to buy an airplane to do this, but if you buy an airplane, one of the great things is that these planes that are great planes, they may be 20 or 25 or 30 years old, is that they're not going to depreciate beyond the price that you've already paid for them. So you can enjoy this airplane for two, three, four years, and while you've got some maintenance costs, you're going to be able to turn around and sell it pretty much for what you bought it for. That's because the cost of a new plane is so high that these depreciated airplanes are hanging in there pretty well. If I had a piece of advice for you on, on buying or investing in an airplane or looking at joining a flying club, that's another great way the lower the cost of, 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 of flying it would be, keep it simple. Start with a simple plane, start with a fixed gear plane, start with a plane that's probably 150 or 160 or 180 horsepower. Um, you know, start with a plane that can carry three people and a little bit of baggage comfortably because you're going to want to use this plane on missions that are more than just you're flying around by, your, by, by yourself. So in the, in the great scheme of things, 
Um, if you look at your various options, flight schools, partnerships in a plane, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I should have said flying clubs as opposed to flight schools, or, or maybe even just going out as you're getting started and renting a plane for, uh, you know, $110, $120 an hour, which is kind of the going rate for a, for a 172, um, which is still kind of one of the basic three passenger trainers that are out there. Um, just go and, and, and do it and recognize that you're going to spend some money, but if you're going to be spending money on, on recreation, if you're going to be spending money on changing your life, if you're going to be spending money on a passive renewal, if you're going to be spending money on something that's a great new mental challenge for you, you can't beat this. It is cheap when you look at it from that particular perspective. The piece of advice I have about this is just go and do it. Just go all in because if you go all in, you'll take it really seriously and you'll never regret that you got back into flying um, in, in, in a big kind of a way. You know, it, it, Jason, back to you. Yeah, you know, thanks, Jim. You know, it's so funny when you put it that way. When you compare it to a hobby like having a motorcycle or having a boat or having a, you know, a vacation home, something along those lines that people don't think twice about. Um, a lot. That, that's a really great perspective uh, and a great way to look at it. I just have a few things I want to add to that. <clears throat> you know, maybe uh, purchasing an airplane uh, is still five years out for you, let's say, or maybe, you know, there's no flying clubs in your area. Um, some other great tips for just getting up in the air in general are, have you ever considered going to your flight school and asking if you could backseat a flight? That is a great way to slowly segue back into aviation or you're, you're down for six months, uh, having a friend take you up flying, maybe, maybe split some costs. Hey, listen, you know, I know it's about 80 bucks in gas. If we split it, you know, 50, 50, here's 40 bucks. Um, is that cool? Let's go fly for lunch, something. Consider that guys. You've got, the important thing is you've got to put yourself out there. These sort of things just aren't going to come to you. You've got to kind of be that squeaky wheel and again, get out to the airport and get involved to get those backseat opportunities, to find those cost sharing opportunities, to find those flying clubs and, and great aircraft for sale. So um, great point, uh, Jim, and, and what an interesting way to, to look at that, uh, putting all that into perspective. Let's, um, let's piggyback off that because my tip number seven is this. For my current pilots and my pilots that are going to be current here very soon, I want you to. Uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm a flight instructor. I'm saying this because I'm your friend and I want you to be the safest pilot possible. I, I challenge you to schedule an instructional fight, flight at least once per quarter. Just four times a year. You know, that's all I ask. Call up your instructor if he or she is still there and schedule a flight with them. And then from there, here's what I want you to practice. After you've scheduled your flight, tip number eight is this. And guys, note takers, write this down. This is, uh, this is the point I really wanna drive home. I want you to practice these three things. If you don't practice anything else on your quarterly lessons, I want you to practice these. The first is, landings, approaches if you're an instrument guy, and crosswind work. Too many times as pilots, I find we shy away from crosswinds. We go, oh, geez, well, you know, good thing, you know, I have runways all 90 degrees apart from one another, and I, I never have to deal with a crosswind. We shy away from crosswinds. And sometimes years go by, even if we're current, since we do a crosswind. And then that one day comes, when you're flying into an airport and there's only one runway and your only option is to land in a crosswind. Uh, Larry shares me stories all the time of up in Ann Arbor where they get some serious winds up in Michigan. And he deals with at Ann Arbor where there's just one runway and you're coming back down and it's it, sure enough, it's a, you know, a 90 degree uh, 10 knot crosswind in a, in a 172. Um, that can be intimidating if you're not current. I, I challenge you to go out and find a crosswind. Request the tower puts you on a runway, assuming they're not busy with a crosswind. Or if you're an uncontrolled pilot-controlled airport, make sure you let everybody know what you're doing and do a touch and go or a full stop taxi back on that crosswind runway. Landings and approaches for my instrument guys. 
here's the other thing. And geez, this really should be point number one because uh, I, I, it's really that important. I want you to practice aeronautical decision making every single day. This sounds crazy, but I promise you can do it in just 10 seconds. All my online ground school members know this and do this. I'm challenging you guys right now to read a METAR a day. You wake up and the first thing you do is you go on the HEMS tool or you go on aviationweather.gov or ForeFlight or FlyQ, whatever you use, and you pull up your METAR. I prefer you leave the METAR raw. I'm not a big fan of translated METARs, but I prefer you leave the METAR raw. And I want you to read that METAR. And then the most important thing, I want you to walk outside and experience that METAR. Because listen to this, guys. It is one thing to read, oh, 2,000 feet scattered. Cool. What does that mean? Well, let's walk outside and let's see what a scattered layer looks like. Let's see what clouds at 2,000 feet look like. Let's see what eight knots of wind feels like. So next time when you read 2,000 foot broken, you go, geez, if that scattered layer was that full, if it's broken, it's a lot thicker. I I'm probably just doing pattern work today. There's no way I'm doing my cross country now. I challenge you to read a METAR a day, go outside and experience it, and make a go or no-go decision based on that, whether you're flying that day or not. When you keep your decision muscle you know, in practice and keep it working, you're going to become a safer pilot. So I challenge you, read a METAR each day, go outside and experience it, and make a go or no-go decision based on that METAR you read and the current environment that you're dealing with. That's my challenge to you guys. The third thing is this, emergency procedures. Who on this webinar that's not actively training can remember the last time they practiced some emergency procedures? An engine failure in flight, engine failure on takeoff. What about an emergency descent? Uh, would you know what to do if you had an engine fire on start? Do you even know where your fire extinguisher is kept? What would you do in the event of an emergency? Too many times I ask that question and it's, oh, geez, the last time I did a simulated engine failure, oh, that was on my private pilot check ride like four years ago. I think, what do you mean the last time you did a, you know, how do you even remember what your glide ratio is like in that airplane, what that airplane feels like at its best glide speed, how to pick out a landing area, all this sort of stuff. Practice your emergency procedures. You can do this on your quarterly flights with your instructor, or you can do it on your own. You could make it as simple as I'm on the downwind, I'm a beam the numbers, carb heat on, power back to idle, and do a power off 180. Just feeling what that airplane's like at its best glide speed is so important, guys. All right? If you don't practice anything else, practice these three things. Landings, approaches from my IFR guys, and include the crosswind work. Aeronautical decision-making plus reading a METAR a day and emergency procedures, guys. These are just so, so important. All right? So what else, guys? Think about it. What has changed since you last flew? That's what was so exciting. When Bill Clayton, again, you guys have seen him in the Flying Again trailer. Uh, when Bill came to fly with me, it was a matter of, geez, Bill hasn't flown in 28 years, was it, Bill? I mean, I, I can't remember, but... What's changed since you last flew? Well, there was no GPS. There were, there were no, you know, iPads. Um, so, I mean, think of what's just changed in the past five years. The medical requirements for individuals under 40 has changed. Uh, registrations now have to be re-registered for aircraft. There's so many things that have changed. Sectional chart symbols that have changed just in the past five years. We can't afford to be out of aviation. I understand life gets in the way, but you need to find a way and make time for this awesome hobby or possible career, depending on how you look at it, uh, that you're pursuing right now. Um, it, it truly is that important. It's the difference between currency and proficiency. The difference between am I you know, just abiding the law, I'm current, or am I truly a safe pilot? So what has changed since you last flew? That's the question if you're a true rusty pilot on here. I want to turn it, I want to really end on a high note here. Then I'm going to give you some next steps and then we're going to open it up for your questions. But I want to end 
Uh, Jim, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but Jim, there's people from all, all levels of flight training. We've got student pilots on this webinar. We've got professional ATP pilots. We've got rusty laps pilots of 20 years. And we've got pilots who are just looking to, you know, how can I stay current? I'm not flying as much as I'd like to. What, if you had to boil it down to a best tip, what might that be? Well, well, Jason, I would, I would, uh, I would boil it down to one thing, um, and that is know what you don't know. When you, when you get back into flying, no matter how much studying you do um, at the desk in your living room, how much stuff you time you spend online, um, when you get back into that cockpit, and uh, and as Jason said, it's a, it's a, not a great learning environment once you're once you're in a cockpit. Be prepared for everything you do. One of the things that I would add, um, Jason, to your to your three great things that that you must do is I would add add practicing in your mind every time you get in that airplane what you're going to do if you have an emergency on takeoff. It's it's probably the the, the most dangerous time that you will have. Um, in an air, in an aircraft is is, um, is is really upon when you're going down that runway and you take off and if you have a power loss or a power failure or uh, or an enormously surprising uh, uh, crosswind or downdraft or, or something that rattles you um, know what you're going to do with every single circumstance that could happen to you on on takeoff very, very important um, in, in, in my book, um, it, it, right up there with practicing those, those, those crosswind landings. So, so my tip is always be thinking about what you don't know, and every time you go flying and you go through that checklist, add something else to that checklist that is something of your own that you need to know, but you know you just don't quite have it down to the level you should should get it down to the level you should and if you do that every time you climb into that cockpit you will be a much safer pilot i uh, i totally agree with you and i had a awesome uh flight instructor geez almost 10 years ago now uh before we were we were holding short we we're ready to take off and he would say, always ask me these three questions jason what are you going to do if the engine quits and we're still on the ground I'd say, well, that, that's easy, Ray. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, you know, I'm going to just pull off the runway. I'm, I'm thankful I'm on the ground. Great. What are we going to do if the engine quits and there's still runway available? Well, easy. I'm going to nose that airplane down. If I have time, I'm going to add some flaps. I'll land it back on that runway. And then he'd ask the real important question. Okay, Jason, what are you going to do if the engine quits and there's no usable runway left? And that's where I think, okay, I'm departing runway five. There's a cow pasture off to my left. There's a street off to my right. I'm going to try to avoid that and go to that cow pasture there. That's my emergency landing site. I'm not going to turn back to the runway under 1,000 feet. And I, I kid you not, for our 40, 50 lessons, every single time before I took off, those three questions were asked. Um, and it's exactly what you said, preparing for the unknown. I call that in like cross-country flying flying around fat, dumb, and happy. You get up there, you cruise out. Some people turn the autopilot on if they're lucky enough to have an autopilot and you just sit back. And I call that flying around fat, dumb, and happy. I mean, I'm always monitoring this and checking this and listening to this and trying to pick up this ATIS. And there's always something to be learning up there about what's coming up next and, and be predicting that. So uh, Jim, I think that's, a, that's an awesome, awesome tip. So guys, uh, I, I don't wanna leave you hanging here. Let's share what's next, okay? So two schools of thought here. Rusty pilot needing to get current. Uh, I'm gonna let Jim talk here in a second about the Rusty Pilot Program, which I think is a awesome program. And maybe you need some motivation or wanna see that process or just see a really cool flying movie. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen it. Uh, we've got about three days left on our Kickstarter to back it. Uh, to get a copy of the DVD, uh, a chance to fly with me, a ton of really, really great rewards. I encourage you guys, if you have not made a pledge, or if you just want to see the trailer, see some great flying footage, see what we're up to, go to flyingagainmovie.com. Flyingagainmovie.com. I believe Sunday, late Sunday night, that Kickstarter campaign ends, 
and that's your last chance to pre-order a DVD copy until it comes out at Sun and Fun. So um, flyingagainmovie.com, check that out and see that. Um, and, and Jim, if, if you wouldn't mind just sharing uh, about the awesome program you guys are doing right now uh, for Rusty Pilots and, and, and how Rusty Pilots on this webinar can get involved. Well, thank you, Jason. Yes, we have a uh, we have a very active Rusty Pilots program um, at AOPA um, in in partnership with uh, with Jason and many other flight instructors um, ar around the country. Um, we're doing Rusty Pilots seminars. I think we have six or seven of them coming up in the in the over the next couple of months um, uh, in in six or seven different states around the country, and then we'll be adding to these. We also do Rusty Pilot seminars around our fly-ins. We'll be doing four fly-ins next year, uh, including one at our five, a, a fifth one at our headquarters in Frederick, uh, Maryland. We have Rusty Pilot seminars um, in in all of those as well. I, I think the key thing here is um, if you have any questions um, about this, go to rustypilots.org um, and and look at the upcoming sessions that we have. And then if you if you need any help at all in identifying um, a great flight school or a great flight instructor, um, send us an email um, at AOPA. You'll see that at rustypilots.org or feel free to email me. Um, at uh, jim.minnow at aopa.org, or you can even call me. My phone number is 301-695-2269, um, and, and I'll see to it that we can connect you with, uh, with a great flight school in your area. Awesome. Again, guys, uh, there, your URLs are down there to check everything out. Uh, do check out the movie. Do check out the Rusty Pilot Program. These are your two next steps to take some action uh, and, and remain proficient or get proficient in this case. So guys, I'm gonna open up uh, the floor to you now. If you have a question for myself or a question for Jim, um, whether it's about the Rusty Pilot Program, whether it's about the movie, whether it's about anything aviation related, guys, uh, now is your time to ask uh, those questions. So uh, you do that again in your handy dandy go to webinar uh, control panel underneath the question tab. I have that uh, window open uh, as well as uh, Jim does. Uh, John, who uh, who's also uh, he's the director of Flying Again. If you have movie questions, you can ask him. Keith, Larry, Will, a lot of these guys are here to uh, uh, answer your questions. So any flying related questions uh, you guys have. Uh, now is your time to ask away. And uh, um, Jim, again, awesome tips, my friend. I, I, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm taking notes uh, as you're talking. Just, just, it's so cool too to hear, uh, you know, two pilots uh, who are, you know, on the same page um, with everything, with how we prep for stuff, and, and the the passions are just so aligned there. So, um, very, very cool stuff. Let's see, um, let's see here. Um, I'm just kind of reading through some stuff here. Um, uh, Michael asked, uh, what flight simulator programs are currently available? Michael, uh, X-Plane is the way to go. Unfortunately, Microsoft discontinued uh, creation and support of, uh, of Microsoft Flight Simulator. So that, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is that. Um, Let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, and again, all this is coming up. Uh, Jim, if you see uh, any questions that you want to answer, just just chime on in. I'm kind of... Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not seeing any on my screen, so I'll just listen to yours. Yeah, and I'll, okay, I'll and read some good screen. ones. Uh, you can pull up your uh, your control panel over there, Jim. Uh, if you if you want to oh, see okay. them, they'll pop up. It says questions, and there's a little arrow on the right, and that'll make it big if you want to see them all that are coming up here. There's a lot. Gotcha. Um, let all right. Me, let's see. Um, awesome, awesome. All right. Let's see. Will, if you wouldn't mind helping Robert with Pilot Edge. Um, Tracy asked a good question, and I'm going to give you my honest opinion here, Tracy. Tracy asked, Jason, what are your thoughts on the 10 to 14 day accelerated instrument programs? Um, I believe there is a place for them, Tracy. Um, I personally, and I'm okay saying this on the record, um, I'm personally not totally crazy about them. Here's why. Because, gosh, 
being an instrument pilot is, is such a challenge. I, I kid you not, Tracy, that was other than my CF double I check ride, which is to teach instrument pilot, instrument pilot was my hardest check ride I took. And, and I find it difficult to, to cram that all into like 10 days, let's say. All that knowledge you would possibly need to know to go blazing through the clouds and shooting approaches down to minimums. Now, Tracy, if you've had a busy life and that is the only way you're going to get an instrument ticket, I'm okay with that. But I want you to walk into that program, Tracy, understanding that, listen, that, you know, I'm not ready to go blazing approaches down to minimums. I'm going to use my instrument pilot certificate. Uh, rating to, geez, when it's broken at 2,000 feet so I can go up and above the clouds, that type of stuff, and build up my confidence there and build, you know, fill in some gaps and some holes that might have been in my training. That, that's my professional opinion, uh, Tracy, uh, with that. So um, let's see. Let's see. Um, cool, cool, cool. Just kind of reading some stuff here. Um, uh, good, uh, Julie add my biggest challenge is knowing how much I don't know. I, I, just like Jim was talking about Julie. Uh, I was last current in 1993 in a Navy C two. Uh, I'm getting back into flying. Uh, but no, I have so much groundwork, airspace, emergency pr procedures, et cetera, to learn. I'm doing a single engine add on. Um, will the flight examiner treat me as a single engine applicant or ask me to do my highest rating multi-engine instrument, uh, uh, commercial, um, let me just reread this. I'm not going to give you, uh, you're getting back into it. Um, so Julie, it depends how you want to get back into it. And, and Jim, maybe you can chime in too a little bit about this, you know, helping her, uh, get involved with the rusty pilot program, uh, as well. I mean, obviously you, you were at one point and you still are a very qualified pilot, Julie. It's just a matter of getting current again. If you just, it depends on what privileges you want to exercise, Julie. Um, as far as your flight review goes, your flight review can be just that, a flight review. If you want it to be an IPC, instrument proficiency check as well, it can be. But essentially, it can be just a uh, um, a flight review. And Julie, if you want to let us know what airport you're at, uh, maybe Jim can do some research and figure out um, where there's possibly a seminar near you that you can attend. That would be really, really great. Uh, I'll see if she types that back and forth. A lot of questions. Again, I'm, I'm a little bit behind on questions here. Um Let's see. Let's see. Continuing to read. Um, Jamie asked a good question, Jim, and I'm going to let you take this one. Jamie asked, how do I convince non-pilots that flying is safe? Boy, that's a, that's, that's a great question that I'm, uh, um, that, that I have, that I'm, that I'm grappling with all the time because, because people will ask me, well, like how many years has it been since you've flown, f flown Jim? Um, so, you know, the way I like to answer that question is is uh, uh, is, is is to say that 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 flying, as in general aviation, um, is not as safe as flying commercial aviation. Mm -hmm. It's not as safe as driving an automobile per mile driven, as opposed to for you know per per mile flown. Um, but it's safer than just about any other thing that you can do in motorized transportation. Um, boating um, has its risks. Everything has its risks. Uh, boating has its risks. Motorcycle riding certainly has its risks. Automobile driving, although everybody does it, has its risks. I was in uh, I was in uh, Dallas, Texas yesterday, and on and and on the highway. There, um, there, you know, they have these like fear signs out there, noting that there were 3,055 automobile deaths in the state of Texas so far this year. Well, the year's almost over, so, so 3,000 people died in automobile accidents in one state alone. Um, last year, 2,000 people died. 200 people, excuse me, 200 people died um, in general aviation accidents. So, the 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 fact of the matter is that that general aviation per mile flown over two million takeoffs and landings a year per mile flown um, is about as relatively safe as any motorized sport that or any motorized form of transportation except commercial aviation um, that, that, that anyone can participate in. The, the problem and the challenge that we face with this of course is, is, is that 
small aircraft accidents are always in the newspaper because they make great copy. There are, you know, there are airplane accidents, I'm sorry, automobile accidents and motorcycle accidents every single day of the year in every single community in the United States. But they rarely make the newspapers anymore in, unless it's a really horrific accident. Um, airplane accidents make that kind of good copy and so unfortunately it leaves people with the impression that generally aviation is, is, is not safe. The best thing I think you can do in, in speaking with people about this is to talk about the focus that almost every single pilot that flies today has on safety. The safety training that's available to you as a pilot, the safety training that's available to everybody else as a pilot. The, the AOPA has its Air Safety Institute, which is uh, essentially an institution really within general aviation uh, for, for flying safety. Um, and the safety record shows that it pays off. The, the number of aircraft accidents and the number of deaths and serious injuries has declined significantly over, over the past 20 years and continues to step down year after year after year. The best thing you can do to convince somebody that it's safe is to get them in the airplane and take them up. Once they're up and they see how competent you are as a pilot or anybody else is as a, as, as a pilot and that you're focused on safety, um, they'll have a different change in perspective. Not an easy thing to do. I, I realize that you're not going to convince everybody, but if we could get everybody in a small airplane once, um, I, I think this whole focus on is it really safe will, uh, uh, will diminish somewhat, probably won't ever completely go away, but, um, but it's, it, it's certainly something that, uh, um, that, that we all wrestle with, with pilots, with people who just think what we do is, uh, is too risky. No, I, I think you're right. The, the media is always looking for the next story, unfortunately. It seems to hit home, uh, you know, all too often sometime. Just uh, reading some more great comments, some other great stuff. Brent said, not really a question. This is the most personal webinar for me yet. Really hit home on several points you made. Made me rethink my chair practice time I've been missing. Thanks, guys. Well, Brent, thanks for listening. Um, Jim, another one. I don't mean to keep throwing you so many questions, but uh, uh, Terry asked if you could talk a little bit more about uh, medicals for rusty pilots and maybe some issues you're seeing there or some remedies you have for helping these rusty pilots out uh, with their medicals. Well, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the first thing I would say is, um, is do what you can to stay in shape. You know, exercise, eat well, um, moderate any, um, any, any alcohol content, any alcohol intake that you, um, that, that you have, you know, Take care of yourself, and um, uh, and and it'll show up in your medicals that you're that, that you are in that, that you are in good health. Um, AOPA has a uh, has a medical hotline that you can you can call. You can talk to our pilot information center, um, and they can give you uh, you know far better and more informed advice than um, that, that than I can. Um, I I can tell you. Um, um, story after story of you know of individuals who you know look this is just my opinion on this but I, but but I would say you know like you know you've got really healthy pilots and then there's some other folks that you say you know gee I'm 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 really a little surprised that this guy is passing his medical um, but but you but you know what if you if you focus on your health if you um, if you create a good relationship with your medical examiner. Um, if you're honest with them, if they're forthright, if you let them know of any medications that you're taking, if you let them know of any issues that you're that that that, that you're having, I think it's rare that you're going to get uh, that you're going to get tossed out on on medical reasons. At least that's 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 my experience. I was meeting yesterday with a um, with a guy who has a serious um, vision issue in one eye. He's got one eye that's great. He's got another eye that has a serious vision issue, um, causes him sometimes to see double vision and other kinds of things. And he continues to pass his medical because he's able to, um, to you know, to really convince the medical examiner that his vision is 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 more than adequate um, to to number one pass the vision test, but number number two to fly. So 
so I don't think this is, uh, for most of us, as, as, as big an obstacle as we think it might be. Um, keep yourself in good shape, and if you think you might have an issue and, and need a way to address it, um, call the AOPA pilot hotline, and there'll be somebody there to help you. And on that note, too, uh, John uh, uh, just left a comment. and said, plug for AOPA. I'm a 62-year-old student pilot. One call gave me specific guidance on working the FAA processes for special issuance. Uh, peace of mind, I'm a huge AOPA fan, very sharp people. So great, uh, great testimonials coming in there. Just looking for uh, uh, just some more great stuff. Um, reading through all of these. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Jim said, oh no, I'm sorry. Gene said, hey Jim, uh, what is the story on uh, driver's license for medical for the private pilot ticket? Have we made any progress in that or is it still kind of in a political uh, stalemate right now? Jim, do you know? Um, yeah, great, um, great question. Um, is that this is um, this is going to come out of the Department of Transportation um, any day? We're told it's it's uh, it, it's currently sitting with uh, uh, with the, the senior administrators in the Department of Transportation who are um, are are going to be moving it, um, uh, you know, basically from the FAA through the Department of Transportation. Um, uh, back to um, back to Congress for action. Um, we remain um, pretty optimistic um, that uh, that the that the third class medical uh, reform uh, is is uh, is, is going to come out in a positive way for pilots, and that and, and that and that most of us will be able to in the future fly um, uh, fly without a third class uh, without having to have a third class medical. Um, um, with, with you know probably some very modest re modest restrictions, um, we we really have you know nothing to really say other than you know to, to, to really reach it, help us reach that conclusion, you know other other than the fact that that, that within the, the the federal government there doesn't seem to be a lot of pushback on this and more at 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 the staff level so. Um, again, we don't really know where this is. The signs seem to be pretty positive. Um, it's supposed to be coming out of the Department of Transportation um, any day. Um, when it comes out of the Transportation Department of Transportation, we won't know anything more than uh, that than we know right now. But but all the signs are 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 looking pretty positive at at this point. For those of you who signed the petition. Um, thank you very much. Um, it had a huge impact um, in, in pushing this through, uh, through, through the FAA. Um, we have um, the, the General Aviation Caucus in, in Congress is, um, is the largest caucus anywhere. Um, so we feel we have, uh, we have a lot of supporters um, in, in Congress when this eventually gets to, uh, um, to that particular level. And, uh, and stay tuned with uh, uh, checking the AOPA website because uh, at any time we know anything more um, that, that we can report, that's where it will be first. Awesome. Awesome. Cool stuff, Jim. Appreciate the update on that. Uh, let's see a few other questions we're taking. Again, guys, guys, this time is for you. Uh, if you're not on uh, the Rusty Pilot website or on flyingagainmovie.com, uh, hopefully you're asking a great question uh, right now. This is your time uh, to ask away. And again, you can do that via your handy dandy go to webinar control panel. Um, let's see here. John asked, uh, touch and goes, how relevant are they to training? Full stop taxi back seem more realistic. Uh, again, guys, any aviation related questions like John just asked are all fair game. So feel free to ask away. John, I am more of a full stop taxi back kind of guy. Here's why. First off, you made a great point because they are more realistic. Um, secondly, as the aircraft owner, honestly, they're easier on my airplane. Uh, than doing touch and goes over and over and over. Uh, and lastly, and anyone who's recently done a private pilot check ride will tell you this, that your private pilot check ride is all full stop, off the runway, taxi back. Um, you don't do touch and goes. You'll do go arounds for my you know instrument stuff and everything, but you don't do touch and goes on a check ride anymore. They're all full stop taxi back. Uh, and that's something the FAA has come out with. So um, yes, it, it, it takes a little more time. Yes, I understand it causes that Hobbs meter to uh, uh, to work a little bit more. Um, 
you know, so it might uh, affect the wall a little bit more, but uh, that is how I teach. Uh, that's how I do it. I teach full stop taxi backs. Unless I'm at like a 10,000 foot runway where we can land, let it kind of roll out and still have another 8,000 feet of runway to use, uh, I'm a full stop taxi back um, each and every time here. So um, let's see, let's see. Um, Nathan asked a great question here. He said, Jason, maybe off topic, but one thing I find the hardest is studying. I'm getting ready to take my checker and my brain is all over uh, all over the place with studying. What's your take? Um, Nathan, it all comes down to you. You need to realize how you learn best. Obviously, Nathan, you ended up on m0a.com somehow. You probably found one of our videos. Maybe it's because you're a visual learner and that's how you learn. Maybe you like hearing stuff. I mean, uh, I guarantee uh, there's 50% of the people on this webinar that I travel with them in their cars because they listen to our, our flight train radio podcast. They listen to our pass your private pilot check ride uh, audio book. The thing is, is make yourself study when you have those, that, that downtime, you know, when you're driving, when you're sitting in line somewhere at the bank, whatever it may be. And then when you do have set study time, you know, kind of chunk it all together. Okay. I am going to learn everything I can about class Bravo airspace tonight. And that's cool. You can learn everything there is about Class Bravo Airspace in, you know, 30 minutes of a few good videos and some reading. You can know the, you know, the, the communications, the VFR cloud clearance requirements. You can learn what you need to know in a half an hour and, and work through it that way. Uh, that is what uh, that's what I would uh, uh, recommend here. So uh, just some really great comments uh, here. Very, very uh, good, good stuff. Let's see. Thank you guys for all the positive stuff. Uh, Jim, we're getting a lot of just great positive thank yous. I know I'm making sure you can see all those here. Um, uh, let's see. Christian asked, will this presentation be available? Yeah, Christian, I'm going to make this PDF available as well as the recording. As soon as we get done here, I'm going to export it uh, and I'm going to get it up online. Uh, it'll be up either late tonight or uh, uh, first thing in the uh, uh, in the morning here. Uh, there's my buddy uh, Jimmy. Jimmy asked, hey Jimmy, he said, uh, uh, every year the FAA comes out with new regulations and amendments to regulations. What is the best way to stay current on new regs and how do we know which regulations are the one are the new ones and when they will take effect? Uh, Jimmy, you know from back, and Jimmy and I prepped for our CFIs. Uh, together. So Jimmy, you remember back in our you know study and days, we'd bust out those old FAR aims, those big old black tabs to show us which regs have changed. They don't say specifically which ones. They just say a regulation on this page has changed. But does that apply to me? Uh, does that really mean anything to me? Um, what I've found, uh, Jimmy, is, geez, AOPA is always on top of this sort of stuff, you know, update and everything else. Uh, uh, the FAA's website's okay, um, but they they'll share some stuff. It's a very the FAA's website's very difficult. I'm not crazy about it. It's very it's a government website. What can you say about it? It's very difficult to navigate. But a lot of the regulation changes will will appear up there as well. Um, my daily routine is I, I wake up, I have my three or four aviation sites. I check AOPA is one of them, um, and they're always keeping up to date on you know sleep apnea and this and that and, and all these regulations and changes that affect us. So I kind of make it a habit to check that sort of stuff, Jimmy. Uh, you know, that's what I'm doing. Um, obviously, you'll get the updates every year when the new FAR aim comes out, but you, you'll get it first on something like AOPA. So I kind of make it a habit to, you know, Jimmy, I know you're busy with, uh, you know, uh, everything you're doing, but maybe make it a habit that once a week, just, re, you know, check out AOPA's website and see what's happening and what's, uh, uh, what's happening there. So um, let's see, just uh, uh, continuing to um, read questions here. Gabriel said, hey, Jason, I signed up to pass the written. Uh, what area should I focus most on? Um, Gabriel, it's kind of a broad question, but I'll give you, so I'll give you a general answer again, because I'm not seeing your, your written test prep scores or anything, but where I find most students struggle, Gabriel, is in two areas. It's that silly navigation section where they bust out these sectional charts, and it's the VOR section where they give you, you're currently showing HSIB, which aircraft best represents HSIB, and you're going, 
first off, you're like, what's an HSI? I don't have one of those in my airplane. Uh, you know, if you're flying an older airplane like I have, um, and, and you're looking at everything, trying to figure that out. And what I find, because you're, you're probably prepping online, is when those sectional charts come up, you're going, ah, oh, just, just whatever, let's skip it. I can't work through all those. Or, the, or the, the problems that require a little bit of math, I find we skip too many times. But you're going to be amazed that when 10 out of those 60 questions are the flight planning questions. You're going to be real thankful that you sat down and took the time to learn those. So, um, so that is uh, that. Uh, uh, great comments from uh, Marty, Tom. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for the, for the kind comments. Christian, thank you. Thank you. Joseph, thank you. Um, great. Chris, thank you. Uh, uh, awesome. Just great, great uh, comments here. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Just reading through these again, guys. Any questions, any comments? Uh, Phil brought up a great point here. Said you may want to mention there's a new way to search for uh, NOTAMs for where you're flying versus the long list. That, that Talk about a recent update, like what Jimmy was talking about. Maybe not a regulation update. Uh, but finally, and again, I read about it first on AOPA, um, the, the FAA has made their NOTAM website a whole lot easier. Uh, to actually find and decipher NOTAMs previously. And those of you who've done this know what I'm talking about. You type in your airport identifier, you get some crazy NOTAMs. They're in this language that makes METARs and TAFs look easy to read um, because you're wondering, what does that mean? And there's no translate. No one's ever really taught you how to read this weird, complex NOTAM. Um, Half the time, Phil, it led to me picking up the phone and calling the flight service station saying, hey, I know there's a NOTAM around here, uh, but what... Uh, uh, you know, what does that mean uh, uh, to me? So uh, cool, cool stuff here. Um, awesome, Bruno. Hey, glad hey, to hey, hear it. Glad to hear it. Bunch of uh, great stuff here. Um, let's see, guys. Any other, guys, first off, I've only got like two or three questions left. If I haven't read your question or missed a question, you're going to need to retype it for me. Uh, again, we're kind of we got a lot uh, here, but we're, we're sticking around for you guys to help you guys with these questions. Um, this is all. Uh, this is your time. We're here for you. Um, Mark asks, how often do webinars happen? My goal uh, going into 2015 is to do a, a pub, big free public webinar like this every quarter. <coughs> uh, excuse me, Mark. Uh, that's my goal going into 2015 because they're just so beneficial. Um, I do a webinar every Monday night with my online ground school members. So every week I do them and we do great topics like these. It's a much smaller group, obviously. So it's much, you know, we can really communicate and talk back and forth. So, uh, uh, very, very, uh, cool here. Um, Julie said, thanks so much for the motivation. I need to go all in. That sounds like a Jim Minow phrase right there. Uh, cool, Julie. Well, congratulations on that. Julie, by the way, is in the Fresno, California area, Jim. So I don't know if you have anything uh, rusty pilot wise coming out or maybe she can make a trip um, somewhere. We'll, yeah, we'll, look, we'll look at that. Hey, yeah. Jason, uh, you, have, you got a good question on um, apprehension about talking with the ATC and towers you might want to address. I thought that was a good question. Cool. Do you see? Can you see who's asking that? I must have skipped over that one. Um, if their name pops up. Yeah, it's on. a little bit. Uh, let me go back up. Uh, yeah, Howard is asking that question. How do you help, and what advice do you have for a student who is apprehensive in talking with ATC wow, and yeah. Tower? Perfect. Yeah, just found that one too. Yeah, great question, uh, Howard. And and just to share my story, you guys know I'm a, a rambler and a storyteller sometimes, but. I, I was that apprehensive pilot, Howard. Let me <clears throat> let me just briefly go through my story. So uh, at the time, Ocala was a uncontrolled, or I'm trying to use the word pilot controlled because uncontrolled just doesn't sound very good, uh, pilot controlled airport. I was awesome at talking to other pilots. Uh, as you can imagine, I like to talk. Um, so I was great at that, Howard. But I had to do that thing, you know, where you have to fly to a tower at airport, do your three takeoffs and landings to a full stop to meet that FAA requirement. So I flew up to the Gainesville airport, Howard. And I flew up there. And Howard, I was so nervous. I remember I was shaking. I imagine they heard, heard the vibration in my voice. I was so nervous. And I go and I, and I land the airplane and everything, you know, is A-OK. -okay. And I'm like, oh, OK, great. I knew I had to do full stop taxi backs. So, um, and again, I land. I can't remember what the runway is. Let's say it was 2-4. Um, I land and they say, oh, uh, uh, five nine or 
whatever I was, 1-1 Julie at that time. Uh, go ahead, uh, taxi off on uh, taxiway alpha, taxi back to 2-4. Uh, oh, no big, uh, taxi at 2-4, no big deal. Well, instead of turning towards 2-4, what do you think I do? Well, I turn towards the reciprocal and I'm literally going the wrong way uh, down the taxiway. And Gainesville Tower comes back on Howard and goes, uh, hey, 1-1 Juliet, uh, what are you doing? Literally, exactly what he said. What are you doing? I said, oh, well, well, I'm a student pilot. I'm from the Ocala Airport, and the FAA requires you to do these three takeoffs and landings, so we don't have a tower down there. So I came up here, and I'm doing these landings. That was my first one, uh, and I'm going back around and do it again. And he goes, no, no, one one Juliet, you don't understand. Where are you going? Oh, well, I'm going to eventually be going back to the Ocala Airport here. And finally, he keys the mic goes, no, one one Juliet, you're going the wrong way. It was like a bad version of, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles. You're going the wrong way. Thinking, oh. So I turn around the taxiway. As you can imagine, Howard, you know, I just embarrass myself in front of this controller. I'm really, really flustered. I get to the end of the runway, and I kid you not, Howard, it is a miracle that the Gainesville Airport was, was dead that day. I get to the end. And instead of doing the smart thing, Howard, which would be to stop and, and hold short and wait and call him and tell him I'm ready. I don't know what happened to me. Here I am, a 10-hour student pilot had just soloed. Howard, I pulled out onto the middle of the runway, and I called him up and said, Gainesville Tower, 1-1 Juliet's ready for takeoff. And I, I can't repeat the words that that controller said to me, but they hurt my feelings really bad um, to the extent of, you know, you needed to hold short. What do you do in the middle of my runway? You're real thankful nobody else was on short final because you just caused a runway incursion and a violation effectively. Um, you know, I flew back with my tail between my legs to the Ocala airport. I'll never forget my instructor uh, was waiting for me, which I found to be very odd. And she goes, how was your flight, Jason? I'm like, oh, it was great. Uh, yeah, great landings. That was all good. And I got my truck and I left because something told me she knew uh, exactly what happened since I confessed my whole story to this guy. So, Howard, again, I don't mean to ramble, but talk about being apprehensive. Uh, I was the king of apprehension, especially after that flight. I, I was afraid that all controllers were out to get me. And, Howard, it took me becoming an instrument pilot to get over that. And anyone out there who's a private pilot – who plans on doing their instrument, but believes radio and ATC communications are a weakness of theirs, you're doing yourself a disservice because instrument flying is all about talking on those radios. That's what it's all about. Um, there's so much communication involved. So if you're apprehensive, Howard, I encourage you to work into it slowly with an instructor at a small class Delta airport. I challenge you to pick up VFR flight following on some of your flights. And Howard, I highly recommend you follow, I can't remember the tip number, but whatever tip number it was, tip number four, to invest in a flight simulator with something like Pilot Edge to work on those radio goals. Excuse me. Because that Jason, is what's if, I might go. add, if I might add something, sure. um, especially for, for, for VFR, um, there are um, th three things that I always like to remember, and I've, I've heard you say this over and over again in, in, uh, when you're communicating on the radio, even with, with, with towers, especially initially. Always, always remember that you can't go wrong if you're saying who you are, where you are, and what you want to do. And then you're going to get some instructions back. So have a piece of paper ready. Um, practice your shorthand. So when you get those instructions, remember that what is then expected of me is that I read them back. Um, and so you read them back, and you know what? The, the controller is going to say, good to go. And, 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 and it's a lot easier than, than, than you might think. Um, but if you're a little apprehensive, practice it when there's not a lot of traffic around. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree, Jim. Great, great points. Um, reading some other ones here. Again, guys, I'm sorry if I'm missing them. They're coming in like uh, rapid fire here, so I'm trying to stay on top of everything. Uh, well said. Uh, do you recommend any books for the instrument knowledge test? Uh, I am personally a big fan of, uh, of the Glime products. For a, if you actually want a book, uh, they're local to us. They're just up the road in Gainesville. Uh, very good friends uh, with the with the Glim family. Um, I would go that route if you really want a book. Uh, if not, we if you want to do something online, we do have an FAA uh, written test prep boot camp 
that we did actually via webinar. It's all recordings, everything else. Uh, some good stuff in there if you want the online aspect of it as well. If you want to hold a book, though, I'd go the Glim route. Uh, and that you can get that on Amazon, uh, Sporties, wherever you need to get that. Uh, uh, Dave asked, does this seminar count for Wings credit? You know, Dave, I didn't really put a lot of thought into that. Um, but I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to say, Dave, Wings credit. And I am going to apply for Wings credit for this. Uh, and I'll email that out to everybody. Uh, once that's approved, uh, if you guys would like to get that wings credit. So uh, I will do that uh, for you as well here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, that's Howard's. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Uh, Jim, it looks like Matthew has a question about uh, uh, AOPA membership. Uh, uh, you wanna, do you see that one and do you want to take that one real quick? Um, sure, I'm not. I'm not seeing the question, but um, but yes, we would we would we would love to have you as a member. Um, if you are a rusty pilot and not uh, and not current, you will qualify for a student membership and get a bit of a discount there. Um, you know, best way to to uh, to to join is to go to uh, uh, aopa.org and there's a membership button and you can and you can join right online. Uh, membership uh, dues uh, currently are $59 a year. Let me tell you, it is the it is the best $59 bargain that you will find anywhere. For that, you get uh, 12 issues a year of either a flight training magazine or AOPA pilot. Uh, your choice. Um, uh, they're both great magazines. Um, if you're if if you're really really feeling new to flying, uh, tra a flight training magazine is is terrific and then you can switch over to AOPA pilot uh, any any time you uh, uh, think think you might be ready um, there are terrific uh, safety uh, programs available uh, to uh, um, to members there are online webinars like like this one there are safety programs um, that uh, uh, that uh, take take place in communities across the country and you can find all of that information um, um, online through the Air Safety Institute. You can also it's also publicized um, in our magazine, which is uh, just really a great way to stay uh, to stay current on everything that's happening in the world of aviation. So, um, thanks for the question, and, uh, and 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 I hope you sign up. Absolutely, absolutely. I also want to say thank you to Norman and. Uh... Uh, Louise, who just uh, made their pledge on that flyingagainmovie.com uh, domain name to get a copy of the uh, DVD when that comes out. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Also, Howard, I want to add to your ATC comment. Uh, Phil, Chris, and a few others, uh, Joseph shared uh, about using live ATC. Uh, I totally forgot about that. You're absolutely right. I'm a big fan of live ATC. Liveatc.net uh, is the domain name. Um, and you can listen, Howard, to your local approach controller, your local ground controller, tower controller, whatever it may be. And I like to sort of, you know, sit back and pretend that, okay, if I was out there, if I was that plane, how would I read back that call that I was just given from from that controller? Use something like Live ATC. I know that uh, Larry, when he's on his lunch breaks, just sits down, eats his lunch, and listens to Live ATC. Uh, Larry is a very accomplished CFII uh, and is still always learning something and just really, um, you know, that into uh, uh, to aviation. Uh, absolutely. So uh, let's see here. Willie said, Jason, uh, would you please take a few minutes to talk about the relevance of pre-planning on the ground at home before flying, especially going on a cross country? Um, yeah, absolutely, Willie. Uh, here's my kind of routine. When I know I have a flight coming up, and hopefully I know, you know, a week in advance at least, I'm starting to check weather. I'm jumping on skyvector.com. I'm taking a peek at my routes. Is there any airspace that I'm going to worry about? Restricted area, MOAs, prohibited areas, big Bravo, anything like that, that I need to worry about and start to plan for. Um, you know, as it gets closer, it's all about weather. Where, where are my frontal system? Where, is the, where are the low pressure system? The things that I really don't want to see, I'm making sure they stay away from my route. I'm working on making go and no go decisions very, very early on. Um, but all my planning for a flight starts on the ground. You'll never find me just showing up to the airport going, hey, let's go to Kentucky today. It doesn't happen that way. Everything is done, uh, hope, preferably weeks in advance, assuming I know about the flight um, ahead of time. And it starts on websites like Sky Vector. 
uh, you know, it, it starts on, uh, you know, weather tools like uh, what Jim mentioned again, the HEMS tool, which I'm going to start using. I'm looking at it actually, you know, uh, now on my phone kind of as we're talking. I mean, just great, great uh, tips, great, great tools um, there. Let's see. Uh, Chris also added in there about the radio communications, possibly paying a visit up to your local control tower. Those guys are so – guys and gals out there are so friendly. Um Find the tower number. You can get it from your local flight service station and uh, c consider making a phone call and say, hey, listen, uh, when you guys are you know, slow, maybe around like 2, 3 p.m., could I swing up and just meet you guys and kind of see what you do? Um, you're going to feel a whole lot better about making your radio calls when you meet these guys and see they're not just uh, uh, you know, crazy guys who want to yell at you uh, on the radio. So um, it kind of puts a, a human element uh, into that. So uh, good, good stuff here. Uh, let's see. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Let's see here. A uh, bunch of thank yous here. Um, cool, cool stuff. Uh, guys, any other questions, any other comments? Am I missing anything here? I know the guys are typing in over there. I know Jim's looking. I'm looking. Um, anything else question-wise that I am uh, um, missing here? I don't... Uh, um, oh, Keith has a good question. Uh, Keith said, could you recommend some apps to practice radio communications? Keith, uh, we actually have a great app, uh, not so much to practice radio communications, but to learn about radio communications. If you just search in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, depending if you're an Android guy or an, or an Apple guy, uh, just search VFR Radio Communications. It's a free app. It'll say the publisher, m0a.com. You'll see that there. Uh, just download that. It's a lot of our... It's basically a, a collaborative of all our best uh, radio communications videos uh, for you guys to check that out. Um, Terry said, this has been the best yeah, webinar Jason, ever. One, one thing, uh, cool stuff. I appreciate that, Terry. Um, let's see here. Willie asked, uh, what is the first flight lesson that a new student pilot should be taught? Oh, geez. What a... I start, geez, usually my first flight lesson, like an intro flight, let's say we're not talking about the discovery flight, you know, where you fly around, show them, introduce them to aviation. Our first flight lesson, uh, you know, I, I may be a heartbreaker here, but most of it is on the ground. Uh, call, call me old fashioned, call me boring, but we're spending a lot of time on the pre-flight. We're spending a lot of time on those checklists. We're spending a lot of time learning about our airplane on the ground. I know that's not exciting. I know that's not glamorous because all people want to do is do the fun part, get up there and fly. But you've got to build the foundation and the foundation starts on the ground. Um, and then when we actually do get to fly, it's all very basic. Let's hold the airplane level. Okay. Uh, you know, let's, you have two types of new pilots. You have the pilots who only want to look outside, and then you have the pilots who only want to look inside. I find out what kind of pilot you are, and we make adjustments accordingly from there as well. So that's kind of our first lesson. At least starts with me, and other instructors will be different. Um, a bunch of thank yous. Uh, any other questions? Any other comments, guys? We're about to wrap this thing up here. Uh, if not, you guys know how to get in touch with me. Uh, Jim shared his email and his information as well. This recording will be up if you want to see anything. Again, I'm going to work very hard to get that out and get that emailed uh, over to you guys. So, uh, Jim, thanks so much for joining us. And I, I know your schedule is just crazy. Uh, and I appreciate you for taking time out of your, your busy schedule and out of your family life to kind of just share the good word of aviation and what the, the great team you have over there at AOPA is doing. And I really, really appreciate your time, my friend. Yeah, well, thank you, Jason. This has been, uh, this has been a great evening. Awesome. Well, well, thanks, Jim. And guys, thanks so much, guys, you too, for taking time out of your evening. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing uh, on a Thursday night, and I really mean it uh, when I say you guys are the 1%. Uh, who are out there always learning. Uh, you guys are just uh, just such a blessing to myself, uh, my beautiful wife, Ashley, this wonderful team here at M0A.com. Guys, if there is anything, myself, the M0A.com team, the great team over there at AOPA uh, can do this week to help make you a safer, smarter pilot, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Guys, enjoy the rest of your evening, and most importantly, remember, but a good pilot is always learning. Have a great night, guys. Thanks and see ya.